With Into the Dragonfly's story being an almost endless topic, it was a given that an update would need to take place eventually. We've got many new developer phone calls, tons and tons of all kinds of cut content, and much more. Nearly everything discussed here today happens to have never been known by the public. Until now! Please enjoy another instalment in the Spyro 4 documentary featuring over 30 developers from the game. As for early level names, we've heard a ton of them throughout researching. Dragonfly Dojo's early rendition Sparks Pond later became Egg Fu Young, and was only changed within the last six months of development. While Luau Island began as Dragon Keys before its design was changed and split into the finalised Luau Island and removed level Cutthroat Cove. Even Monkey Monastery was first known as Monkey Monk Mountains. Enchanted Forest was first known as Fresh Pine Forest before becoming Emerald Forest. Interestingly enough, the cut level Baked Alaska and early name Egg Foo Young for Dragonfly Dojo are names based on actual foods, likely being a developer gag. On an updated note, before Sparks Pond was the original Dragonfly Dojo, it was a Flash game released on the official Spyro website in 2001. This ties back in with how the Dragonfly capture mechanic was inspired from Season of Ice on the Game Boy. With so many ideas being pitched for Spyro 4, very few actually stuck due to Universal's pickiness and constant switching of their ideas. At one stage in development, Spyro would have started the game without his 5 rep, and he would have had to regain it from Bianca very early in the game. The idea remained prevalent for so long that it's even referenced within the game's manual. Speaking of that, it's also stated that frogs were planned fodder for the game. In fact, within the game's model names, it shows that the frog model was used as the basis for various other models. In short, this means frog fodder was created within the first months of development and likely would have appeared in Cutthroat Cove. A huge variety of other vehicles were also worked on throughout development, with some including a rocket, a surfboard, and a mech vehicle. Cutthroat Cove would have even featured that surfboard, with Spyro likely being able to traverse the tops of waves in a minigame. Besides the new cut levels we've discovered, an additional one would have been themed around a monsoon. In fact, there's code left in the game for a rain weather effect with only snow being in the game for Monkey Monastery. This deleted monsoon level would have likely featured a rainy, destroyed looking environment and potentially even could have been similar or actually been Cutthroat Cove at one point. After Scott Smith informed us of a secret credits that gave credit to those who never got their rightful name in the game, we instantly began pondering on how to discover the inputs to access this cheat. Several months down the line, it was found that the code circle up, circle, circle up, when inputted into the first page of the atlas, actually unlocks a new page which is in fact the secret credits. Each of these names are to be expected, with Ken's being the secretary in the Check 6 office who told everyone to head home once the project was temporarily cancelled. However, the final two stand out, which appear to be close friends or family to Tammy Yap, who programmed this secret credits menu in the first place. It's quite insane to think that this cheat code in the game has never been accessed by anyone up until this point in time. More cheats exist beyond that. In fact, when left, right, 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 X is inputted on the pause menu, the game will run in slow motion. This was a cheat created by programmer Bob Shade, who actually just created it for fun, even though it later ended up being used for testing the game. The developers referred to it as bullet time and was inspired by the Matrix, as were certain Thieves' Den Dragonfly names. I worked on the moving platforms and the special effects, the dragon brush and the decals the dragon brush makes when it hits a wall, and also of the decals of like the burn marks from the dragon breath and then when he's skating around when he gets on ice you know he skates and i made the little trails 
I was brought on late in the development of the game. They brought on a bunch of new people. The game had all kinds of issues with it. Just with the constant turnover of people, we're getting new code and writing new code, trying to pick up where other people left off. Yeah, I worked with Jason. They're okay to work with. We had all kinds of deadlines. It was a tough project. I built them in slow motion that was actually taken out later. Well, I built that. I built the ball time. That was just me fooling around. Furthermore, if you want Sparks to turn purple, just enter in left, right, right, left, X. If you can recall, Sparks was actually purple in a lot of beta material for the game, due to the fact that he was still in progress. While the names in the secret credits are interesting and revealing, a ton of other people who worked on Into the Dragonfly were never credited anywhere. One of those people was Joe Height, who actually had a pretty substantial role on the project. He was producer on the game throughout the last half year of development, but left before it shipped, which excluded him from the credits. We managed to arrange a call with him. Here's a look at that. X6 Studios was working on Into the Dragonfly 4 with Universal, and they needed their own line, line producer for Tech 6 to be responsible for working with the programmers and the artists. Around that time, the CEOs of Tech 6 Studios were trying to start their own company doing another game. I can't remember the, the name of the game because I was supposed to be on the Dragonfly one. I was commuting from San Diego every day to Venice Beach. It to be a little bit much. I can't remember if I, if, if I quit or if it was kind of a mutual thing because it, things were falling apart. I reports of the mark. So I would go and um, see the burn of the game, get, get the latest build of the game, and see what was going on with it. It was so convoluted, sequenced. Just checking the art, checking to see if it actually was able to play. So it was more playing through the order of it. It didn't feel rushed. When I was there, it never felt like it was going to be completed. It felt like I didn't have authority. I also know that Ricky had an idea for the soundtrack. He wanted to use Stuart Copeland. He was kind of fixated on getting, getting that in the game and getting Stuart Copeland to do that. For me, I, I was less worried about getting Stuart Copeland, letting that be Universal's job to do that post. I was more worried about getting the game done. And it seems like I was having a hard time get, doing that. And my thought process was that if he has those contacts and that will help the game sell, Universal should take advantage of that. Everybody got along well. Everybody was friendly. There was no hostility. Egg Fu Young, I think is what it was called. Egg Fu Young turned into Dojo something. Well, one of the things that happened, in fact, I believe, is that was it John Mark? Didn't they start another game company in Paris? One of the guys who actually sticks out with me was a, was a guy who couldn't really walk. He had damaged legs. Jason Forty. He was a great guy. We had a conversation about his debilitation legs. And for me, I like making connections. You could tell I took your phone call. I like to be accommodating to, pe to people and connect with them where I can. And he gave me a book, the Gary Adams, the cartoon from the far side. He let me borrow this book that I read. And it was very, very meaningful to me that he did that at the time for me. He gave me a gift. I left after that. He stuck around. In your life, you meet people who are good guys. He was one of the good guys. For me, what I remember is I asked him one time, what were his hopes? Did he hope to ever like, get married or something like that? And he said yes. He said he would like to dance when he gets married. And the only way I was thinking about that was prosthetics, like robotic prosthetic legs or something like that. And I thought, how do we make that happen? Considering Ricky really wanted to get Copeland back on the project, it was only natural that he got his way. But not after a long time of convincing him and even suffering many problems which caused the music to only be composed right before release. Stewart even said in an interview how he felt detached from Spyro while working on Enter the Dragonfly, and that he didn't even recognise an advertisement he was shown as being Spyro. 
There are also some weird goings on, such as how Spyro has a different eye texture within certain minigames. Also how Crop Circle was going to have a cow tipping minigame. Another cool tidbit is how you can see a sparks looking particle effect underneath the dragonflies when their capture animation plays. Speaking of dragonflies, they were also originally called ladybugs and later fireflies. Skill points were also an intended feature and were even planned for the flammable bushes in Cloud9. One day we had the chance to talk to Gary who worked on optimising the game as a whole at Universal. He provided valuable insight into the inner workings of the game and how the process of optimising a game back in the early 2000s functioned. Let's take a look at a very detailed email he graciously sent us. Shockingly, an Equinox member actually uploaded two video files from a beta version of the game to Vimeo. However, the bad news is the files no longer exist because the account was deleted. But luckily two thumbnails still remain showing off the beta look the water had in Dragonfly Dojo. The purpose of these clips was to document the Equinox members' work they had done on the interactive water. As had been talked about several times before, the final level sequence order took a long time to get right and was changed very frequently, with Luau Island being the second level originally, and Enchanted Forest being the last level in the game. This is also the reason why the ability stones for Spyro's Breaths are randomly placed within certain levels, being a very late 2002 addition. Oasis Speedway actually wasn't intended to be found within Thieves' Den originally. In fact, Thieves' Den and Oasis both feature many textures and models that were ripped straight from Cutthroat Cove. The Cutthroat Cove chest in Jurassic Jungle has this particular yellow pattern texture that's found within so many objects in Thieves' Den. When you take into account that Cutthroat Cove would have featured Spanish architecture, pirates, and would have been a water level, these lighthouses, pyramids, and palm trees really further the fact that Oasis was intended for Cutthroat Cove. Even the music for Oasis, when compared to the short Pirates track, featured the same sample and style, signifying the connection between the two. The snakes in Oasis also have an unused design, where its textures become darker and the bottom two vases have cracks. This look actually sometimes shows up after restarting the race and was intended to be used when the snake was flamed. This was likely done very early in development, and it's quite similar to how Insomniac handled the original trilogy's enemies. 
Rainbow Speedway's song originated as Monkey Monastery's main theme, as heard in the demo. Peter Neff composed Monkey Monastery's songs, as well as Rainbow Speedway, while Stuart Copeland composed Cloud Nine's other two tracks. Just compare all three of the Speedway tracks together, and it becomes apparent that Rainbow does not feature the upbeat nature of a minigame. Speedways also feature vocals literally within the first second of their tracks, yet Rainbow Speedway lacks vocals entirely. On the other hand, Cloud9's track name is called Songer, which matches with the unused track Songer, meaning they were likely paired in the same level originally. Icons used throughout the levels and minigames also happen to typically be a beta version of the character or item they represent. A lot of the Speedway characters have very different textures and designs in their icons, as well as Jurassic's Lava Item Collection mission having an entirely different icon than what you actually collect. The scripting definitely has a lot to break down, from an idea where Spyro would chase down a bunny to get a key in Cloud9, to a koala being an early character idea or even Norks being referenced early on, and a mysterious Cyber Egg being a character in Jurassic Jungle. There's also Beta Breath names, as well as a character named King Kong being used for testing interactions with Spyro. Beyond this, there are many other notable pieces of info we will take a look at now. Besides the sound effects Warren handed over to us from a beta build, there are a good amount of other unused sound effects found within the final release. Some happen to be leftovers from earlier Spyro games, meaning that Vivendi did actually give Check 6 access to the sounds at least, even though they refused to give them any other Spyro assets. Spyro himself would have received a huge upgrade in his facial expressions and added reactions to the environment in the form of tons of animations. The majority of these would have been used when talking with NPCs, however, others include Spyro holding his breath as he exits swimming, which is strangely never used in the final release.
We later even planned a Check 6 reunion where developers would come together to reminisce about the game after not talking about it for almost 20 years. Luckily both Jason Furrier and Warren Davis came together with us to discuss an array of new info and development stories about the project after being glad to have reconnected after all this time. Hey Warren, how's it going? It's going good, how about you? Going well. Nice to reconnect, I guess, after all these years. Let's talk about some Spyro, boy. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I'd love to hear what you remember. I was, I was telling Kyle, I, I like, I don't know, just a, a lot of these memories. Uh, I mean, I haven't thought about this this game in years. Even when when the experience ended, I, I kind of feel like I tried to wash my brain of a lot of it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, it, it was a bit on the traumatic side. Did but, he stick um, around for um, when we we got that unannounced um, that second game that we were working on the uh, the mummy thing? No, I never worked on that. Okay, yeah, I stuck around pretty much till the bitter end, which wasn't yeah. that much longer after Spiral, honestly. I'll, I'll tell you what I remember about Check Six. You know, I was hired by Joel. He was the guy who recommended me and got me in. Uh, Joel got hired to be the game designer and they were staffing up and he recommended me and uh, you know the timing was good um, so yeah I came on board I do I'll, here's a story I, I, I remember is that they were in an, a small office they weren't on Main Street in Venice was that probably where they were when you started yes yeah which is pretty fine real estate oh yeah that was a really that was an awesome office that was before Equinox and Check Six merged, and a oh, real early. I do remember one of the first days I came in, or maybe it was when I came in for an interview. It was Jimmy's birthday, so Jimmy was the lead programmer. Mm -hmm. The uh, I can't remember his last name. Alan Brando. He was the lead programmer. It was his birthday, and they. They hired a stripper. <laughs> oh, to I heard do about a dance that. Dance for his birthday. <laughs> I heard about so, that. Yeah, I heard rumors about that. That was unusual. That was That's exactly pretty awesome. Not something that had happened yeah. a lot in my. Career. Do you remember? <laughs> do you remember that? Um, that some of the guys who worked at Check Six had like these little kind of cartoon caricatures done of them. No, that I don't bells? remember that. As I do, yeah, a few of a few of the Check Six guys had that and they were like taped up on their office wall. And I still remember Jimmy had one and his like superhero alter ego was called Doctor Pervo. And I think uh -huh. you know, probably had some connection to the stripper thing. Well anyway, so then then they didn't, you know, merge with uh, Equinox and, and shared that space. And at the beginning, you know, we were, we were still staffing up. I guess that was somewhere during then, I'm not sure exactly when into the project you came, but Joel was already gone. So that means you came in, you know, there was already problems because, you know, we had mm -hmm. problems. They were developing this engine. I guess there were all these stories I remember hearing about before I even got there. Kyle was telling me some stuff that, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't exactly remember, but it sort of triggered some vague memories. I came on in, in March of 02, so at that point, you guys already had, um, like, a few, you know, a few of the levels, uh, at least blocked out, and, um, if not final, uh, and, you know, Spyro, Spyro was working, Spark, uh, the sidekick Sparks was working, uh, but it was far from done, they were freaking out and they hired a bunch of new guys, including me to get it done, including John Bohorquez. They brought all those guys on to basically like try and get it done before in time for Christmas. And that's, and, and we did, miraculously. Yeah. <laughs> so Ken's said, go home, Warren. We're everybody, we, they sent everybody home. They had a big fight. <laughs> they, they said it's over, they're throwing in the towel and they're just <laughs> not, they won't talk to each other. And I said, what? <laughs> Guess we were, this is at a point where it was like, you know, I feel like the, it was when the end was somewhere in sight, you know? <laughs> and, and I knew that relationships, the relationship between them had deteriorated, but it's like, I don't know, I just something in me kind of snapped and I said, no, I am not going to allow this to happen. <laughs> and I, I didn't leave, 
and I made everybody get into the conference room. So there was like, you know, there was Jean-Marc and Jack on the Czech Six side and Arye and Sean on, on the Equinox side and maybe a couple of other people and Ken was there and we just and I, I basically acted as a mediator uh, moderator and I said okay what is the problem here why did <laughs> you and then, you got them back together you you solved you solved the fight I did so yeah. so wow. I take credit for the game being finished <laughs> but I'm not proud of it <laughs> I'm not sure I made the right decision I didn't... it might have been better to let the thing just die then and there and, and I, I've always wondered if that might not have been the better choice. I do remember a fight, and I don't know if uh, you had much awareness of it, but it was... Um, you remember Dale, the uh, the IT guy who worked for Equinox? I mean, he was everybody's IT guy, but he, he was paid by Equinox. One day, Jean-Marc was telling um, Dale to do something, and I don't know, Dale was offering some kind of resistance, Jean-Marc went away, and then, like, Evelyn, you know, Jean-Marc's wife, came back and started arguing with Dale, and, and, like, they didn't, they couldn't come to terms over what they were arguing with. And then Jean-Marc came back and, like, said something like, like, what did you say to my wife? And, like, made it personal and started, like, shoving chairs and stuff. And, yeah, and it got really ugly. Um, and, you know, fortunately, it never came to, came to blows, but, like, that was when... Like at that moment, Sean Mark said, "Like you're fired or something." Like, <laughs> even though we had no, we had no. He wasn't our employee, and we had no, you know, like backup plan for an IT guy. So right. I remember that. That was that. I'm sure that was uh, that was uh, along, you know, part of the whole Equinox Check Six uh, conflict. I mean, I remember even like the part before you were there. The, the game, you could just see the game was in trouble for a number of reasons. One, you know, Joel, the original designer, was trying to make Universal happy, but in doing so, he kept on having to make changes to the design, and mm -hmm. we're in the thick of, you know, so they've signed off on the design, basically, and we're in the thick of production, and then Ricky, you remember Ricky, him and Joel could, you know, couldn't agree on things, and then Joel, which eventually ended in Joel leaving, because Joel felt like, well, you know, I'm not the designer anymore. I mean, this guy is making me change things to the point where, you know, not, you know, Joel wasn't happy with the design anymore. And then also, we were becoming less and less able to implement it. Then there were engine yeah. problems, right? The engine really was un, you know, just not ready for prime time. You know, they, 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 had yeah, they built that whole thing from scratch. Yeah. And, and, and they kept thinking, all right, well, we'll get the frame rates up and stuff, but somehow, it just never got there. Yep. Uh, and I'm not much of an engine guy. I'm more of a higher level guy. And, you know, I was working on Spyro and I was working on his physics. And I remember Ricky was never happy with his physics because he wanted it to be exactly like the other three games. And I, I was right. I was very happy with the way his physics turned out. You know, I, I, I didn't know how to make it any better than I did. But it's like without, the, without uh, Insomniac's code or without at least you know, some kind of notes to say this is how they did it, or this is the algorithm they used. In fact, how do they expect us to, to duplicate it? Right. So, and and again, you know, my goal was not was never to duplicate it. My goal was to make it feel like Spyro. There were problems all along. And then you had Jimmy, who was the lead programmer, who was a great programmer and a great guy, but a terrible manager. He just didn't... <laughs> He, he didn't like conflict or he didn't like, you know, cracking the whip. Well, I don't know what it was, but uh, I just, you know, felt like there was no leadership. He didn't really provide leadership for the team. Mm -hmm. And that's why towards the end, I kind of took on that role. And I know John came on as a lead. And that was also another kind of area of, I mean, I don't, I don't remember having any problems with John at all. But um, right. just the fact that he kind of came in so late, and I just think nobody really is in a good position. When you come into a project that late in a position of leadership, you know, um, it's just, you know, you've got a whole team of people and you, they don't know you, you know? And mm -hmm. they don't know your style and they don't know your way of doing things. So 
you know, and, and just the idea of throwing in a whole bunch of people at the end to get things done, you know, more people means more coordination. So the, the, the more people yeah, all throw on something at the last minute, the more important leadership becomes, and we didn't have that. And then, you know, we, we would pull all-nighters for, like, nights leading up to a milestone, and I remember people would make mistakes, and, you know, we'd introduce crash bugs, and, you know... My, I, I'm personally very much against, you know, pulling all-nighters to, to meet deadlines. I much prefer, you know, look, going going a month before your deadline and saying, this is when we got to start getting serious, right? And, and start mm-hmm. getting disciplined um, so that you can avoid those all-nighters. Uh, mm-hmm. Not a check six. It was like, la, 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 la. Oh, we got three nights left. That's okay. We'll just work all We'll work 24 hours a day for three days. And yeah, I remember doing that. I remember sleeping because I didn't have a car at the time. I remember sleeping at the the office for two nights. Yeah. Oh, I did. I remember that. <laughs> and and going to the omelet parlor for breakfast. The thing that Warren mentioned, it it, uh, it kind of duplicates the impression that I got there, which which is that like I didn't really know who I was supposed to report to as my. Uh, immediate supervisor or who I was supposed to come to with questions. You had Warren, you had John, you had Jimmy, you had Jean-Marc, like, just, yeah, I just kind of go to, <laughs> try one and if that didn't work, go on to the next one. So, and, you know, it, it, it basically my first real job in the industry, I, you know, uh, I, I had a lot of confusion about what to do. Yeah, it, it, it was confusing. There, there really wasn't a clear <laughs> uh, structure. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that I worked with Tammy. Remember Tammy Yap? Yeah, I remember Tammy. Like, I think we sat together. I think we were, we were like in the same little. That sounds right. Like, yeah, yeah. We did not get along all that well sometimes, you know. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it just this project brought out the worst in most people, I think. Um, <laughs> but I, the, the crazy thing for me was that I, I, you know, I was hired by Check Six. I worked for Check Six. I remember I liked um, Arye and Sean from Equinox. I just liked them and got along with them so much more than I did with Jean-Marc. When they told me that they were working on Spyro, you know, my ears perked up immediately. And I went to interview with them. I had a good impression of LA. I looked at the project. What they showed me at the time, it was running silky smooth 60 FPS. It looked beautiful. I was like, yes, this is exactly what I want to work on. So I was like, I'm on board, and they took me. And uh, yeah, much to my disappointment, it didn't take long to realize that, oh yeah, it's it doesn't really run at 60 at all. <laughs> it can run at 60, but it doesn't. I programmed like a couple of the mini games because it was like at the last minute we were like, we need to, we <laughs> we need some mini games, you know. So I, mm-hmm. I literally like furiously in a couple of days programmed a mini game, you know, or two. Um, <laughs> And, yeah, I did a lot of mini game work myself. Yeah, so, was, but I don't, I just don't, I mean, I remember the mini game where you picked up cows and dropped them on a roof. It was built around a scene graph, which I didn't have any experience in before, but it seemed really kind of clunky in the way that anytime you wanted to maneuver anything around, you had to uh, walk down the scene graph and find the object and then detach it and then reattach it somewhere in the scene graph and that often led to a lot of bugs but uh, I remember those aspects of the code and then I worked on a lot of mini games I worked really closely with Ricky on getting Spark to behave exactly the way he wanted it and I think he was kind of happy with it in the end um, mm-hmm. and the baby dragonflies chasing them around but uh, yeah, I remember the code better than I remember the actual game. I hardly remember the game at all. I was surprised that anybody had as much enthusiasm about the game as you do. But, uh, you know, if, if the enthusiasm is out there, then, you know, I want to do my best to try to uh, try to pay tri- tribute to it. So bizarre. Train wreck phenomenon. People are Maybe. fascinated by train wrecks. Nice to talk to you again, Warren. Same here, Jason. While only the PlayStation 2 and GameCube versions were released, Xbox and PC ports were planned and even the engine components for Xbox were created, referred to as DirectX. 
Except since Universal wasn't even willing to pay the money they owed to Check 6 and Equinox for the original two versions, additional development on the final platforms were cancelled in favour of a helicopter special forces project that lasted a dozen weeks. Knowing that there was enough content made for Enter the Dragonfly to fill five Spyros as Randolph had told us, we began peering into every single aspect of the game possible. Starting off, it turns out Check 6 actually left in a ton of unused animation data within the game, but sadly most of the cut content had been cleared up for the final release. Luckily for us, there's still a ton of animations meant for a variety of different things, from talking, running, idle, and other miscellaneous ones. <laughs> well, that wasn't supposed to happen, but...
There's even a lot more cut voiced dialogue for characters all throughout the game from start to finish. These range from lines that were meant to be read by other characters but were screwed up, such as Hunter saying yes and no for the minigame prompts, while others were cut late in development in favour of other lines. Hello Spyro. Those dragonflies must be really frightened. We're all counting on you to find them. Remember, all throughout the dragon realms, you'll find fairies that will save your progress with a little zap. Like this. If you get into too much trouble, you'll return to the last fairy you encountered. And Spyro, make sure you use your breath weapons against any of the really big Riptox. They're just too big to charge. Are you ready to play again? Yeah, bring them on! No, not right now. Okay. No, thanks. Okay, sounds like fun. Nah, not right now. Watch out, Spyro. There are two UFOs this time. Good luck. Watch out, Spyro. Some other UFOs are shooting at you this time. Hey, Spyro. Think you can help me out here real quick? Pick up all the butterfly bottles before the time runs out to win. Let's go. Congratulations! You got them all! Aw, oh, sorry you didn't make it in time. Play again. Aw, oh, darn, Spyro. Looks like that UFO got one of my cows. Well, I still need to get them cows into my corral. You wanna try again? Thanks, Spyro. What I need you to do is use your lightning breath to zap my cows back onto their feet and herd them back into the corral. But you'll have to hurry, cause there's a UFO circling the field which looks like it might be on a cow collecting mission. Alright, go get him, Spyro. Thanks, Spyro. Do you suppose those Riptox would have really eaten us? Those gosh darn travel agents, I knew I couldn't trust them. Not the brightest pork chop on the block, are you? What's that? I said you're welcome. Good for you, Spyro. Things are finally back to normal. Well, normal for a fairy tale world, at least. Okay, see you later then. Welcome to Honey Marsh, Spyro. Them Riptock critters have messed this here place up, but good. Yeah, let's give it another shot. No thanks, I've taken enough of a beating for one day. Hey, look at that, Spyro. It's a dragonfly. <gasps> they are a rare sight in the icy peaks of our monastery. Okay, see you later then. <laughs> I knew you were the right dragon for the job, Spyro! Unfortunately, I forgot my water rings. Say, maybe you can do it? You know, if I could swim, I'd dive under the water and press that switch to open that door. Yeah, not bad! But if I had those water wings, I would have taken care of it myself. Spots where these lines would have existed are alive and well in the game. For example, Luau Island's Last Pig still has an option to talk for dialogue after you've finished getting his dragonfly, but says nothing. Same case with Cloud9's Final Bear. But Crop Circle specifically has the most interesting dialogue with the farmer being the original NPC who helped you with the UFO Cow minigame, as well as the farmer reading out test minigame lines and even cut ideas for Crop Circle. You can even see Sparks reading off dialogue originally meant for Zoe in Dragonfly Dojo's second chunk. Zoe is literally right next to Sparks when this is spoken. Guess Sparks always has to steal the spotlight. Cut dialogue continues, but this time with just the script itself. This aspect of the game is probably one of the most interesting and contains more unused content than the majority. From early ideas of Spyro reporting back to Hunter and the Dragon Elders once he had progressed through the realms, to the chests originally giving gems instead of dragonflies and being found within every level. There are even 10 dragonfly names that aren't used in any level, with 7 of them being direct references to Check 6 and Equinox individuals. It's unknown which unused levels these would have been associated with, although Uncharted Forest is very likely the one due to the fact that it's the only cut level that's still referenced heavily within the final game's files.
The aforementioned lawyers that worked at Universal back in the day actually have an interesting inside look at how Universal functioned. We got into contact with one named Joey Sason, who had the opportunity of working on the legal team, as well as pre- and post-production on an array of early 2000s games such as Crash Bandicoot. Here was a look into what he could recall about his time on the game. I actually worked at Universal Interactive only for a year. So it was about 2001 to 2002, July 2001 to about July 2002. During that period, you know, I worked on several games. I worked on Crash Bandicoot, uh, The Wrath of Cortex. I worked on a Battlestar Galactica game. There was a Scorpion King game I worked on, Incredible Hulk game, as well as uh, Spiral the Dragon. I was really production council pretty much for everything that was going on. Not only the stuff that was in production, but there's some pre-production stuff and other games that have been out and circulating uh, doing some the post-production stuff as well, like in terms of marketing, uh, contracts, stuff like that. So my role there was basically a legal counsel. I just drafted contracts, provided legal advice to the business development team and to the executives and finance team. I'm happy to discuss as much as I can without you know, violating any training client privilege. Uh, I had two bosses when I was there. One, a guy named Philippe Irwin was my first boss. And he eventually left with the Warner Brothers and his position was taken over by a woman named uh, Nancy Reinhardt. If there w was conflict between the two companies, it never filtered down to me, or at least I never heard about it. Or I, if, if I did, I, I, know, to be honest, I can't recall. <laughs> you know, it, was, it wasn't you know, over, over 10 years ago. They didn't have any in-house developers. So what they did is they would contract with third-party developers to make their games, right? So um, they would enter into a, a software development agreement um, with any of the developers. And then they would they would actually provide the IP. I, I just was really involved with them on, on, on just that software development agreement level. And as I say, I can't recall any actual conflict. Universal Interactive, I tell you, I, I only spent a year there, but at least from my experience, it was a very invigorating experience because of the, the sort of energy the company had. It wasn't a very super big group of people. I'd say it was between 45 to 60 people max. It could be even less. Um, so we all, all of us sit on one floor. We, we used to work on the 31st floor at the Universal Studios lot. So if you use Google Maps and you were to uh, look for 10 Universal City Plaza. Right now it's got NBC across the top, NBC Universal. 18 years ago, I was about uh, 33. And I think the average age of everyone else I worked with was probably about, like, I'd say the average age was probably between 25 and 30. Right, so I was a little on the older side, except for the for the senior management team. It would have been like Jim Wilson as the president, a guy named Scott Johnson was the CFO. Of course, my boss was a little older than me. And, but otherwise, it was a pretty young, energetic group, like in terms of uh, the producers, the junior producers, the marketing team, all the admins. It was really fun to come into work. Like, there was a video game lounge set up, so of course, you know, it's in the video game industry, so they set up a lounge. I, I played my, the first Xbox ever. Like, they had Xbox, they had a PS2, um, set up in a GameCube, set up with uh, pretty much all the latest games, and so I, you know, never been that much of a gamer, but it inspired me to go out and you know, get my first Xbox. Of lunch times, I would play Project Gotham. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I'm not sure actually how the developers came around. There's a guy named VJ Latchman. I'm pretty sure he was the guy in charge of this development and maybe production. So I felt like it was always his gig to go out and like meet developers and take their pitches to, to do games. That's how, I know, how they, I'm pretty sure that's how they found the developers. Of course, I was legal counsel and I worked for Philip Irwin and Nancy Reinhardt. I sort of remember actually, of all the games and stuff I worked on in that year, Spyro was one I really, I remember working on the least, to be honest. But I actually had to go up and like, remind myself, I went back and found an old resume that said, yeah, I did work on that. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I sort of re remember working on other stuff more. It may have been farther along in, in the production cycle when I arrived versus like those other games where I think I was more along there from the beginning. And what's the role of the producer, right? Was that a clearly defined role in 
what was he supposed to do? Like, was he just doing his job the way he thought he was doing, supposed to be doing it, right? Because at the end of the day, he didn't work for the developer. The developer worked for Universal. And so if Universal gave him the task of making the best game possible according to his vision, right, then maybe it was the developer's job to, to do those things. Now, if his vision sucked, then the game sucked. But that's, that's not on the ability of the developer, and that's really on Ricky. You've got the publisher who holds the money, and um, they, you know, those, those contracts are purposely written to be in favor of the publisher. At the end of the day, the, the publisher, because they, have, they hold the money, sort of has all the power in a negotiation, right? Even though you know, they're, they're providing services, they have to abide by the milestone schedule that Universal wanted them to, because like, they're, you know, they're trying to hit certain production dates and they need to hit certain things so they can get the product out in the market on time. In my experience, there's always been a tug of war between developer and publisher based on stuff like money and schedule. People overpromise and under, under deliver. So, on one, if you represent a um, publisher in a situation like that, you know, and someone says, hey, I'm going to deliver X, Y, Z on this date, and they say the date, and the date comes and say, listen, I can only give you X and Y. And you're like, well, in that case, you're not going to get your payment. If you follow the general game production, uh, video game industry, and the producers and developers and how that stuff, I think burnout is very high. Their hours are long. Especially when it comes time, like towards the end of game production and stuff, hours are pretty long. It's time it takes its toll. I think I can see that. I think, I think burnouts are pretty high. For legal, like it was never that bad. Like I, I probably worked about 50 hours a week. So I can hear about my fellow co workers working more than 50 hours a week for sure. I, I can't put a number on it, but um, they were probably in the office longer than me. Like I would leave and they'd still be there. Continuing the theme of removed content, various textures also go entirely unused in the game. Even a picture of what appears to be an avocado can be found, which leads us to discussing the fact that a good amount of textures such as the butterflies and dragonflies are based off real-life images of what they were going for. In fact, it even seems like in some cases, actual reference images became the final compressed texture. Here are a wide array of cut textures from the game. This red look for Ripto likely was meant to be used during the second phase of his battle. Because when you consider the fact that there are three stages to the fight, the first being his normal look, second being his red look, and the third being his final monster form makes sense. This is also supported by the fact that Ripto's unused textures correspond with the colour of the flame shield he has in the second round. The flames that circle the arena were also very likely to change per phase, being blue, red, then white. As per the original Spyro trilogy, many magazine adverts were produced for each instalment, but when it came time for Enter the Dragonfly's marketing, they had to scramble to gather any screenshot that wasn't completely a work in progress. They even reused an old Spyro render for a very odd looking page that featured an extremely small image of Monkey Monastery. This particular screenshot appears to be one of the earliest, if not the earliest one taken for the game. Sparrow's model and textures may even be slightly different than the final as well, as Sparks being much farther away from Sparrow than normal, although the quality makes it hard to tell. But even the back of the game's box has some abnormal images to it, containing an entirely cut Jurassic Jungle enemy only seen elsewhere in the game's trailer. 
If there's anyone who knows Enter the Dragonfly better than everyone, that would have to be Randall. He's still able to remember working with each individual of the three companies, as well as the removed content. Both Randolph and Warren are the sole reason the game ever got released in the first place. They also fought back at the corruption and knew they needed to get this product out there no matter what it took. Here's some words from Randolph for his last hurrah, fighting the good fight. Mark Cerny is the god of Spyro in many video games. I have a lot of respect for him. He's a very, very difficult person to work with. He wanted nothing to do with our bullshit studio. <laughs> Alex Carmonero would just belt out artwork, digital art, right there on the spot with no concept, no pencil work, nothing, no painted, nothing conceptual. He would just belt it out. We'd take a screenshot of that and send it up for approval. But it was a pretty brutal shutdown, so I think, you know, uh, the Vendy Universal itself would still have that. One with a giant tree house. It looks like a giant tree. There's a bunch of islands and trees type things. Yeah, I think that's the one that Scott Smith designed, and it was really big. There used to be one where you jump over giant blades or things like that, rotating blades. And it was a full level, but it was part of a it was part of an obstacle course. Swinging blades, I'm sure, was just not realistic. It was not cool. You can't have freaking blades coming in Spyro. The design of that one was pretty rough. There was a uh, a mini game where you're flying through canyons. Those were awful, because we had to come up with those in like a New York minute. There had to be at least, you know, 15 levels cut. The development side of that game is very long, and I know they cut over at least three quarters or half the content out of the game. I did want some that were some, like some ops. I mean, I was completely out of ideas at this point, but I remember just coming up with an obstacle course of various types, and um, they really weren't that cool. The biggest problem that we had between the two studios in the house is that because you have an outsourcing studio that basically focuses on doing commercials and you know tvs you know television commercials or content you know digital content of all kinds um their job is to make things look as beautiful as possible right so when we tell them we want a hallway to go up you know turn go straight forward so many meters turn left at this angle go up at this angle over here and we give them a mock-up of the level rendered in Maya, you know, just in block form. And we say specifically, we need this level, the, we need this hallway to go this or this platform to do that or whatever. And they would make changes because it's more aesthetically pleasing. But at the same time, it breaks the design or creates an A bug because you can't go any further. The game just dead ends. You would have to fight with them on that. And unfortunately, the majority of their staff were from various parts of Japan, China, you name it. And then magically they would just forget how to speak English. <laughs> so sorry, I can't understand you. We're like, what the F? He would fight with his own employees and then he would actually have to go in and make the changes himself physically, the, the, head, of the head of that studio, and then hand it to us. Well, that's the kind of BS internally, you know, it just, it, it sounded all good on paper, I'm sure in the beginning, but an actual application, it was just, you know, so many culture clashes. They spent money on putting in a freaking granite top bar. We never used it. There was so much just stupid spending on things that were completely unnecessary. The layout of the office was ridiculous because the thermostat was at the back of the building away from the sun. And the majority of everyone's workspaces were at the front of the building on the street side. So one side of the office was always like 40 degrees, and the other side of the office was 90 degrees. That was normal. So we'd have just, we were just dying. And of course, um, they didn't tint the windows or anything, so we just put up like construction paper to block the sun. We looked like we were permanently closed from the outside. And then right next door, there was a place where homeless people gathered. So when you go out to lunch or come back, there's just homeless people hitting you up for money. You have no idea. You, you need to feed us. The founders of the company, you know, um, John Mark Morell worked together with Jack Lemias and um, Clancy and Jens Anderson. And they were the original heavy gear team from Activision when they used to do internal development. And Heavy Gear 2 was legendary for wasting ridiculous amounts of money and time. And this was the original team of that. 
And these guys were the reason why Activision stopped doing internal development. I didn't learn that until later. I did run into Jens in a job interview. Um, he went to work at the guys who did EverQuest and they got independent. Now they became Daybreak Studios. He came in and sat in on the call and started asking me questions about Tech 6 and I recognized his voice. I'm like, yeah, I'm not getting this job. He just wanted to troll me. I'm sure if you dug in deep enough, people would just start getting bitter again. People never get over that, you know? It's like you wanted to do a good job. You know, that's why I brought up the whole point about people making deadlines. You know, that this is the first failure in my career. You know, I've never been on a game that was either canceled or a shut down studio or anything like that. One failed spectacularly, so for a lot of us, it was just, yeah, it was just very depressing. I mean, Ricky wanted to hire me to come to the the Universal to drive the, you know, lead design from a point of safety so I would collect a steady paycheck. He offered me a job right then and there and it was approved from the top, whatever his name was. I felt like I would just end up being scapegoated. Try good friends with Jean-Marc Morel. I had to go outside. I don't even smoke, but he and a few other people, like he would smoke outside and stand out in the alley and smoke. And, um, you know, I just came out to vent and he was one of the guys that, you know, that I just <laughs> took up a conversation with. And I said straight to his face, I will never work with Jens Anderson again. This is it. I'm done with him. You know, because all of his little things. And I reached a point, you know, he's one of these guys that takes a vacation right before a major deadline. Everybody else's stuff works except for his. And I told you what happened. If you have a crappy contract, the publisher doesn't have to pay the studio. So all of us starve. He makes a six-figure salary. The rest of us make regular salaries. We can't afford to go without a paycheck. You know, it's not like we live paycheck to paycheck, but we can't just skip paychecks, you know, three or four times in a row. And uh, this guy could, he didn't care. He would go gallivanting all over Europe, you know, snorting up coke in freaking Denmark or wherever the hell he does. But, you know, we, we had major problems with him. So I just said, look, I'm never gonna work with him again. And Frank Gerolami just, he just nodded his head and says, he just looked at me and raised his eyebrows and realized that I was dead serious. And then the very next day, they moved me to Spyro. Russell and Tim had their fair share of stuffing and gags in every single level in the game, from NPC to dragonfly names, dialogue, and even credits. Most of these are based off of popular movies at the time, due to them sometimes watching TV on the job. Take these two over to the garage, will you? I want them cleaned up for dinner. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Hey, it's Toshi Station. We're passing through the magnetic field. Listen to me, Copper Tom. <laughs> hey, it's Neo. <laughs> hey, it's Copper Top. I'm George, George McFly. I'm your density. I mean, your destiny. It could be your density. I mean, your destiny. Hey, it's Homer. Hey, it's Mitnick. 
Even a large chunk of Enchanted Forest's dialogue was ripped straight out of Mike Myers' movie, likely being a basis for what was going to be the level script. They never got around to finalising the dialogue, so it almost remains word for word a scene in So I Married an Axe Murderer. Well, it's a well-known fact, Sonny Jim, that there's a secret society of the five wealthiest people in the world, known as the Pentaverite, mm. who run everything in the world, including the newspapers, and meet tri-annually at a secret country mansion in Colorado known as the Meadows. So who's in this Pentaverite? The Queen, the Vatican, the Gettys, the Rothschilds, and Colonel Sanders before he went tetra. Oh, I hated the colonel with his wee beady eyes and that smug look on his face. Oh, you're gonna buy my chicken. Oh! Dad, how can you hate the colonel? Because he puts an addictive chemical in his chicken that makes. Bianca would have even had a major role within Cloud9 as she was going to be what powered the hourglass. She's still loaded in the level and has code. Whilst she isn't complete, it still shows her basic function. Instead of the final version's dream beams which are powered by Spyro's electricity, Spyro would have walked up to Bianca and she would have flown all the way to the hourglass to activate it with her wand. After all, she did have the power to travel by rainbow in Year of the Dragon. Beyond the invincibility Jurassic offers, or the occasional Super Flame, Super Bubble, Super Ice, Super Electric, and Super Smash are all referred to in the game, but not existing in the final version due to the low level count and not enough time being designated for power-ups. With Monkey Monastery being the first level created, it's only natural that it's the most polished, full of ideas, as well as having cut content present. It not only features a beta atlas picture, but the reflections used for the ice texture also were pictures taken before the layout was final. On top of that, the door that opens once the level is complete only opens on the left side. The right was planned to open as well, but doesn't function entirely. Even the ice platforms you jump across to enter Riptock Bombing originally moved sideways to make the challenge even harder. Speaking of Riptock Bombing, this minigame's geometry was originally entirely different and even features cut models and textures. Both the Manta Ray Capture minigame and Ice Slide feature modelled tunnels that would have connected the minigames to the actual levels being a seamless experience. This is also the case for a few other minigames, but was scrapped simply because having two minigames bundled within the level model would have been a huge feat to accomplish and would have made the game load longer and have been even slower. Loading screens even contain level music specifically edited for them. In total, there are five tracks that range from 24 to 28 seconds. While they do not play normally in the game, when visiting a level from the debug menu, they happen to play as intended. The demo disc even presents fairly unfinished aspects of the game. Sparks has an extra hit point where he turns purple, the pause menu had only begun production and the wing shield is activated differently. Additionally, it actually contains the full version of the bullet time cheat where you can alter the speed and manually move the camera in 360 degrees unlike the final game.
Additional developers have answered more of our looming questions throughout the past months. We've reached out to literally everyone humanly possible, which totals over a hundred individuals. So here's a highlight of some new conversations from LinkedIn. Since the GameCube port had an additional several weeks of development, a lot of optimization and small changes are present. Tons of the textures in the game are also altered and are improperly mapped in due to hasty work. Aspects like the portals and effects are also substantially different between the versions. Each sound file in the game has a description as to what it's meant to play for, which means glancing at the sound list text files shows the intention for all the unused sound effects, as well as several unused ideas and a bunch of other interesting tidbits. With this three-hour documentary halting to a stop, Spyro Enter the Dragonfly goes down as one of the most unfortunate development cycles in the gaming industry to date. This game certainly never deserved all the uproar it got, and still gets to this day. In fact, it's about time someone somewhere gave Enter the Dragonfly the love it deserved, which is primarily the reason this journey began back in February 2018. We hope you enjoyed this very deep look into the game. It was a true honour to research and a wonderful time. Thank you for watching.